host menu that involves the original rows of A, you cannot just look at the reduced row echelon form of the matrix and then go back and pick out the rows. Because you, if you put, unless you've actually done the row reduction by hand and kept track of the rows block. Okay? You, when you put in your calculator and get the reduced row echelon form, you don't know which row or rows have been moved to the bottom because they were linear combinations of other rows. Okay? So you can't just go back to the original matrix and pick out the rows that correspond to the rows that have pivots because you don't know how they got there. Because everything was done in the background in the calculator. What you need to do is you need to take the transpose of the matrix and then row reduce to get those pivots to match up in the columns because that doesn't change. And then go back and take the columns that have it in the reduced row echelon form in the columns in the columns of the transpose because the columns of the transpose don't correspond to the rows. Okay. So if you're asked to find a basis for the row space that involves the original rows of A, transpose it and then row reduce and then do like a column trace. So just want to make sure I mentioned that since nobody did it correctly. <laughs> so. Seemed like that was something I must have not emphasized enough. So I want to make sure that we talked about it. I just saw your <laughs> like, you're right. one. All right. Any questions at all before we keep going with our discuss discussion of angle? Yes, please. Um, number four, mm -hmm. um, number two, um, Oh, in part C? Yeah. Yeah, that should be a U. Thank okay. you. Yep, that should be it. It should be the U's, yeah. yeah. That's a nice typo, thanks. All right, yeah, so in 3C, that's just a typo. It's funny that, I, you know, I sign this every time I teach the class and people don't tell me that I have typos. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. 3C, it should be a U3 on the left-hand side of the equal sign. And then D, they all should be U's, not B's. My apologies. Other questions? Okay. So last time we went through. Oh, why are you doing that? Do that. Last time we talked about how to find length, and then we also talked about how we can do distance of things. Uh, I asked you to look at those properties and said that basically these are just phrasings of things in terms of norms, right? Because we said that the distance between two vectors is defined as what? If you wanted the distance between u and v, how is that defined? Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the norm of the u minus the v, right? Oops. Right. So noticing here in this part, it says that the distance always between two vectors is always non-negative. Well, we're defining the distance in terms of a norm, right? And remember, your norm is defined as the square root of a dot product of a vector with itself. Dot product of a vector with itself it has to be non-negative, and square root of that's going to be non-negative, right? So that's the whole first part. What makes the second part true? How do we know that the distance is zero if and only if the two vectors are the same? Okay, so yeah, if u is equal to v, certainly it's going from right to left. If we assume the two vectors are equal, u minus v is what vector? Zero vector and the zero vector has zero length, right? Okay. So what about 
the other way. We know that the distance is zero. What has to be true about the vector that you're talking about? What's the only vector that has length zero? Zero vector. That's one of our axioms of uh, dot product, inner product, right? The only way you can get a vector that dot products with itself and get zero is if it was a zero vector to start with. So if this is going to equal zero, then u minus v has to be the zero vector or u has to equal v. Okay. So notice this five and six is just a consequence of the fact that distance is defined as norm. Norm is defined as square root of a dot product with a vector with itself. And so really this is just a restatement of axiom four in the language of distance. This is for inner products, axiom four for inner products in the language of distance. Right. Notice that, <laughs> pardon me, notice that um, 7, the left hand side would be norm of u minus v, the right hand side would be norm of v minus u. How is u minus v and v minus u related to one another? Yeah, one's the negative of the other, right? So I can think of this one as the negative of u minus v. And then one of the properties for norm up here says we can do what with the scalar out in front? Pull it out and then take the absolute value, right? And what is absolute value of one, or negative one, I mean? One, yeah. There's a lot of vertical bars there. <laughs> I'll put a multiplication symbol in there so you can see better. Absolute value of negative one times the norm of u minus v. Okay, so there's a lot of vertical bars in there. One of those vertical bars was a one. <laughs> All right. So again, notice this is just a property of norm, right? What do you think eight's going to use? So that five and six matched one and two. Seven matched three. What do you think eight's going to use? Four. Okay. The left hand side is norm of u minus v. Be a little bit clever. Did I change anything when I did that? I just added zero, right? I just added zero cleverly. But now think of these two vectors separately. Using your triangle inequality, if I split it up at the plus sign, it changes the equals to a less than or equal to. And then both of those pieces Both of those pieces is just the definition of distance, and that's a minus sign between the W and the V. So notice that all the, the properties that here that we have for distance are really just consequences of properties of norms. Not a huge surprise because we define distance as doing the norm. This one's probably more what you're used to thinking of as the triangle inequality. If I want to, if you think about it, it certainly is points, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So this would be straight line distance from the end point of U to the end point of E. If I take an intermediate point, it's going to take me at least as long, maybe longer. Right? And that's what triangle inequality means. Okay. All right. Anyway, 
let's switch gears slightly and do the other bit that we said. We talked about the reason why we care about inner products is because inner products allow us to define lengths, define distances, and then define angles. So remember that we proved last time, or I talked about last time and sent you a proof of Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Cauchy-Schwartz inequality said that, not minus, oh, I need to write it as inner product notation anyway, sorry. That the absolute value of the inner product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. That's Cauchy-Schwartz. If I divide both sides by the product of the norms, I'm going to get that that quotient is less than or equal to 1. Since I have absolute value, it might be negative, it might be positive, but if we rewrite this, I notice that the inner product oops, divided by the product of the magnitudes is always between negative 1 and 1. Always. That's just a, that is a consequence of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So we talked about a little bit using the law of cosines to see uh, in vectors in R2 that we saw a dot product over product of magnitude. Well, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality says that no matter what inner product space you're in, your inner product in absolute value is always no bigger than the product of the norms, which means that that quotient is always between negative 1 and 1, which means that I can do the inverse cosine of it and divide what the angle is. Okay? All right. So this is what, it's the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that allows us to define angle in this way, in this way for any, any vector, uh, excuse me, any inner product space that we're talking about, okay? So given the inner product, we can always find angle between two vectors with respect to the inner product. Now, whether or not that makes sense from a geometric perspective is up for debate, However, there are special cases where we want that angle to be 90 degrees because there's be some special properties, and that's where we're headed with this stuff uh, as we go forward. Okay. We're really worried about things being essentially perpendicular to each other. All right, so let's look at a specific example about how we can find angle between two uh, vectors using a non-standard, well, what looks like a non-standard idea for a inner product, this one, we're looking at the vector space of all continuous functions from negative one to one and define the inner product of two functions as the integral from negative one to one of the product of the two functions. This one asks us to find first the angle between one and x and then find the angle between one and three-fourths three x squared. I know it sounds strange, but we're going to do this using that particular inner product. So if I want the inner product of 1 and x, let's do that first. What am I integrating? Just x. And I'm going to use... Uh, I can just do it for the minimum theorem of calculus, but I can look at this and say that the integral is going to be zero because x is an odd function, and I've got an integral, uh, excuse me, an interval symmetric about the origin. So there's as much area above the x-axis as there is below on one side versus the other, so they'll cancel each other out. Well, if the inner product is zero... then that quotient, inner product over product of the magnitudes, is also zero. Inverse cosine of zero is pi over two. So the angle between those two vectors is pi over two. 
I didn't need to calculate their magnitudes because the numerator was zero. Okay. Is that okay? All right. Versus the second part here where it asks you to find the angle between P of X and then the 3 fourths X squared. Well, 1 times 3 fourths x squared is just a 3 fourths x squared. Antiderivative is just 1 fourth x cubed. Plug in 1, plug in negative 1, we get a half. Yeah? We Say it again. Uh, it's minus a negative. I better not get a negative because I have an even function this time instead of an odd one. <laughs> All right. What is with this computer sometimes? I also need the magnitude of each of the vectors in order to be able to find the angle. So I need the inner product of one with itself. We get two. Right? I also need the inner product of 3 fourths x squared with itself. Multiply those together, we get 9 sixteenths x to the fourth. Antiderivative there is what? 9 over 80 x to the fifth? So we'll get 9 over 40. Ends up doubling it, right? Now, it, are those the magnitudes of those vectors? I have to compute the dot product with itself to get the magnitude, but is, is that the magnitude? What do we have to do with the, mag the dot product with itself or the inner product with itself to get the magnitude? Yeah, I gotta take the square root, right? So the magnitude of the, the one is square root of two. The magnitude of three fourths x squared is not a square root of... Uh, 3 over, or what is that, 2 root 10? Okay. I took the square root of 9 over 40. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 40 is, well, 40 is 4 times 10. Square root of 4 is 40. All right. So if we want to figure out what the theta is now, oops, your theta is going to be inverse cosine of what? Good. So your th angle between them is the dot product, the inner product, divided by the product of the magnitude. And our inner product we found in the first part was a half. Magnitude of 1 was root 2. Magnitude of 3 fourths x squared was a 3 over 2 root 10. I need to get a value. 1.4. which is less than pi over 2, that's about 1.57, which makes sense. How do I know that that should be less than pi over 2 rather than bigger than pi over 2? Oh, I see. How do I know that it's, how do I know that the angle should have been less than pi over 2 rather than greater than pi over 2? What's telling me? 
what sign does the uh, does the cosine have if you take it as angle and quadrant one? Positive. It's in quadrant two. It's negative. How do I know then that this is going to be in quadrant one rather than quadrant two? Yeah, because I'm doing the inverse cosine of a positive number. Now, what's going to tell me whether it's positive or negative? Is it the magnitudes or is it the inner product? Well, what's the magnitude always? Positive, right? So it's not the magnitude that tells me whether it's going to be in quadrant one or quadrant two, it's the inner product that tells me if it's going to be quadrant one or quadrant two, right? So the angle between them will be acute, be less than 90 degrees, be less than pi over two, if the dot product is positive, the inner product is positive, it'll be greater than 90 degrees, or between 90 and 180, between pi over two and pi, if your inner product is negative. So I just to write that down. Will you stop moving that? <laughs> Why are you selecting it? Stop it. It's a good thing I inserted it as a printout so it doesn't do that and then it does it anyway. Anyway, all right. So just to write that down. Angle's acute if the dot product is positive. The angle is obtuse if the dot product is negative. Well, it could actually equal pi. What happens in the middle? When does it equal pi over 2? If the dot product is zero. So this is exactly what how we tell if two vectors are what we refer to as ortho pardon me, orthogonal. We don't use the perpendicular, we don't use the word perpendicular for vec general vectors because again, the idea may not be make sense geometrically of what we think is perpendicular to each other, right? <clears throat> In particular, if you think about the function that we just had, there's y equals one. There's y equals x. There's not a real geometric sense of those things being perpendicular to one another, right? It doesn't look like there's any perpendicular. I missed the origin there. There doesn't look like there's any perpendicularity there at all, correct? Okay. It's that's why we don't use the word perpendicular because perpendicular in our mind makes us think that, right? And that's not what we have. All right, so that's why we use orthogonal, but the definition of two vectors being orthogonal literally is the inner product, oops, of the two vectors is zero, okay. So let's look at this example. It asks us to find the, of all the values of K, such that those two vectors, and these are just, Anytime you see vectors written this way, assume that they're vectors, Euclidean vectors, in R and with the usual dot product, okay? Assume that the dot products are usual dot products unless you're told otherwise, okay? Especially for R and. But it's asking you to find all values of K, <clears throat> pardon me, find all the values of K so that these are orthogonal. So what do you, how do you want to solve this? What do you want to do? Yeah, take the inner product and set it equal to zero. Yeah, it's all for K, right? So if I do the inner product of 3K negative 2 with K minus 4, K negative 7, set that equal to zero. What is the inner product of those two vectors? We get three times k minus four. The k times the k gives you k squared. The negative two times the negative seven gives you the positive 14. k squared plus three k plus two equals zero. That factors quite nicely. Let 
Okay, negative one and negative two. This okay? All right. Now, of course, this is all messed up now because the thing's got shifted all around. I move it. Oh, yeah. Do that. That's what I want to see. <laughs> Stupid thing. All right. There we go. All right. So we're going to talk about a special subspace associated with another subspace of the vector space, which is referred to as the orthogonal complement. <clears throat> so we're going to be given a subspace, so whatever it happens to be. We're going to look at the set of everything in the, in the vector space that has a dot product or an inner product of zero with everything in the subspace. So before we go through this, let's think about what that means. If this vector is going to be have a, if it's going to have an inner product or a dot product of zero with w with any w in the subspace, what has to be true uh, with uh, this vector with respect to every single vector in the subspace? What has to be true about those two things? Well, uh, I don't know if that has to be the zero vector, but what has to be true about geometrically, if we think about it as our uh, vectors in Rn, what would have to be true? Again, what, is, what does dot product or inner product equal zero tell us? They're orthogonal or perpendicular, right? So what's true about this vector V with regard to every single vector in W? It's orthogonal, right? So to give you an idea of what I mean by this, Let's say you're in R3 and my subspace looks like a plane. Okay? So all my vectors in W are down here in this plane. If I'm going to be orthogonal to everything, well, where does my vector have to point? Straight up, right? I got to go this way, or I could go straight down, right? My vectors are going to lie along that line, right? So geometrically, if this is my, if this is my W, this is my orthogonal complement to W, or rather than saying orthogonal complement to W, lots of syllables, we say W perp. So we use a little, that little perpendicular symbol as a superscript there, and we just say W perp. Because orthogonal complement is a lot of syllables. And that violates the Stickles, uh, Stickles property of the, or the Stickles conservation of syllables. <laughs> Law of conservation of syllables. Okay. All right. So W perp. It's a thing that's perpendicular, it's a set that's the space that's perpendicular to everything in the original space. Why do we call it an orthogonal complement? Well, the way I have this picture drawn. If we think about it as, it, let's say we're in R3, what dimension would W have if W is a plane? What would the dimension be? It would be 2, right? You have dimension 2, correct? So the two vectors will completely determine a plane, right? So you can think of a basis for W would be two vectors. What's the dimension of that line, W perp? 1. Notice that the, the sum of the two dimensions adds up to three. It fills up the rest of the dimension, right? So that's what we mean by, that's why they call complements of each other. It's everything, it takes up the rest of the dimensions, okay? So if you had, let's say you had a subspace of dimension three in R5, then the orthogonal complement would have to have dimension two, yeah. Exactly. It has to, it, they have to match up to give you the dimension of the whole space. All right. So anyway, the in other words part of this is that the orthogonal complement is the set of all vectors in 
in V that are orthogonal to everything, not just one, but everything in W. Again, it's easier to visualize these things in R2 or R3. So if you have, <clears throat> pardon me, if you have, um, say, R2, everything's in R2, and you had some subspace W, what's W perp going to have to look like? You know, going through the origin that is perpendicular to that line, right? The only way I'm going to be perpendicular to every vector in this space is if I am on that line, right? Does that make sense? And again, W has dimension one. If we're on R2, W perp also has to have dimension one. Because the sum of those dimensions have to equal the, the dimension of the space. All right. Well, again, a little bit easier, I think, to visualize this in R two and R three. Every other big, every every other picture gets weird. Okay. All right. So let's prove some theorems about what has to be true about the orthogonal complement. The first one is that the orthogonal complement really is a subspace. What do we have to do to prove something is a subspace? Yeah, so it has to be closed under scalar uh, uh, under vector addition and scalar multiplication, right? So let's let W1 and W2, I could have called them Vs, but it doesn't matter. V and W perp. Again, what does it mean to be in W perp? Yeah, the orthogonal to everything in W, right? And how do we check orthogonality? Inner product has to be zero. Good. So this inner product with W is zero. And so is this one for all W in W. We want to show that it's closed under addition. So if I want to show that W1 plus W2 is back in W perp, what do we have to show? Good. I have to show that the inner product of W1 plus W2 with W is zero again. Right? That's our defining characteristic for being in W perp. So let's take W1 plus W2, inner product with W. Now I know that the notation's weird, but again, we're really think like to think about this as multiplication. So what can I do with respect to the sum? Split it, all right? It distributes and then what are each of those inner products equal to? So both of those are zero. So the sum's back in there again. So again, this is a nice little review for what we have to do for proving things are in subspaces, right? Think of it closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication. Let's do the scalar multiplication this time. Same idea. So let's let K be a real number. 
do the exact same thing. I need to show that k times a vector in w perp, it has a inner product with any w and w, right, of zero. What can I do with the k? Take it outside, good. And then this inner product again is zero, and we get zero. And again, these two things are true for all W in W. I know technically I didn't show one thing. I didn't show that the... Uh, I did not show that the space we're starting with is not empty. But what definitely has to be in W perp? What vector do you know for a fact has a dot product of zero with any vector? The zero vector, right? So the zero vector is in W perp because the zero vector dotted with anything in W is zero. So by definition, the zero vector is orthogonal to absolutely everything. And then again, like I said, that's why we use orthogonal rather than perpendicularity. The zero vector, we think about it graphically, is just a dot, right? It's hard to imagine a dot being perpendicular to something. <laughs> so, another reason why we use a slightly different word. Even though geometrically, we like to think of orthogonality being perpendicularity, but it may not necessarily make sense all the time geometrically. That okay? All right. So the next thing says that the only intersection that W and W perp can have is the zero vector. Well, we know that any subspace absolutely has the zero vector in it. This says there's nothing else in common. Okay. We'll call it V. All right, so let's start with something that is in the intersection. What does it mean to be in the intersection again? It's in both, right? So in particular, if it's in both, it's in W perp, right? To be in the intersection, it's in both. So in particular, it's in W perp. If it's in W perp, what has to be true? Yeah, it's perpendicular to or orthogonal to everything in W, right? But where else does V live? In W. So let's say, think about it again. V is in W perp, meaning it's orthogonal to everything in W. But it's also in W. So what do those two things together imply? It's orthogonal to itself, right? And again, being orthogonal, what's the definition of being orthogonal? Dot product is zero. So that says that the dot product of V with itself has to be zero. And the only vector that fits that bill is the zero vector. Okay. So let's just write that out. V is in W perp. Then V dotted with W is zero for all W in W. Since V is in W, we have V dotted, oh, I'm writing it as a dot. I should write it with inner product notation, sorry. Let me go back and put my brackets on it. Since V is in W, the inner product is zero. Hence, V is a zero vector. We just talked, I just, we, I just wrote down what we just talked about, right? If it's in the intersection, it's in the orthogonal complement. That means that its inner product with anything in W is zero. In particular, 
B is in W, so the inner product of B with itself is zero, and the only vector that does that is the zero vector. That was what we said in words before I wrote it down. I was just shorter. Questions on that one? And, but again, it kind of makes sense. That, again, if you think about it geometrically, at least for the R2 and the R3, if I have, ooh, bad. if I have some subspace, again, in R2 would be something like a line. If I'm going to be perpendicular to that line, I have to cross the line, right? I have to cross it. Well, lines only cross in one spot. Since the zero vector has to be in both, it has that's the only place where it can cross. That's what we're saying here, right? Same idea in R3. If you've got some plane and you're looking for its orthogonal complement, well, that's a line that's coming perpendicular to it. Again, they can only cross in one point. Since the zero vector has to be in both of them, they're both subspaces, the point is the zero vector. Zero, zero, zero. Right? That's all this is saying. Geometrically, it makes sense if you think about it in R2 and R3, but it works for any inner product space as well. All right. Let's talk a little bit about how we find orthogonal complements. All right, so let's say we have an M by N matrix. The first thing says that the null space and the row space end up being orthogonal complements to of each other. Okay, so remember that remember that the row space is the span of your row vectors. The null space is the set of solutions of the homogeneous system. Right. Let's start with the null space idea first. If I start with the homogeneous system, then think about how the product goes, right? When I This is a column vector. When you do the multiplication, you match the row with the column, correct? Right? So, if I think about this this way, we would match the row with the column. But when we do the product, basically we're taking that row vector and dotting it with the x, aren't we? Right? So when we do this product, we're really getting r1 dot x in the first entry, r2 dot x, or I keep writing dots instead of, I'm going to write it dots because I am doing dot product in RN. We're leaving it. Um, oops, this isn't an n at the bottom. This is an m. There's m rows. I said a was an m by n matrix. Not a big deal. Same idea. So when I do this product, this is what we get, right? If it's going to be in the, or at least what we're trying to solve. But if X is in the null space, this is exactly what we get. So what can I say about X with respect to R1? They're orthogonal, correct? What can I say about X with respect to R2? Orthogonal. All the way down, X is orthogonal to RM. X is orthogonal if it's in the null space. X is orthogonal to every single row vector, right? So what that says, well, if it's, if it's orthogonal to every single row vector, it's going to be orthogonal to everything in the span. Remember, span is set of linear combinations, right? And I know I'm writing it as a dot product notation rather than the bracket notation just because it's a little bit easier. 
This is a linear combination of the row vectors. What can I do with this x when I dot it with it? With respect to the sum, what can we do? Yeah, split it, and then with all the constants, we can pull them out, right? So you can rewrite this as C1, and I'll write it as R1.x. I'll put it on the other side. And then what are all those dot products equal to? Zero. So this whole thing will be zero. Therefore, x is orthogonal to everything in the row space. So x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space. So if it's in the null space, then it's in the orthogonal complement. The other way will work as well. Because if it's in the orthogonal complement, then it's orthogonal to every row. In particular, it's orthogonal to the original rows of the matrix, and so it'll be in the null space. So the row, the, the, the whole moral of this story is that the row space of uh, the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is the null space of A. The next part is just a consequence of that. If I start with the column space of A, How can I write that as a row space? Column space of A is the same thing as the row space of what? A transpose, right? So if I want the orthogonal complement of the column space, that's the orthogonal complement of the row space of the transpose. But we just said that the orthogonal complement of a row space is the null space. So to finish this idea off in the three minutes that we have, maybe this part of the call I want today, but that's okay. We're learning new stuff. It's great. Okay. I want to find a basis for the orthogonal complement of the subspace of R for spanned by those three vectors. Okay. If I want an or when we have vectors in Rn, if we want an orthogonal complement. I need to find a null space. It's essentially just another way to ask for a null space. If I want an orthogonal complement, I want a null space. Right? Null space is orthogonal to row spaces. So what do you think I want to do with these three vectors? If I want to find a null space of a matrix, I need to create a matrix, right? Null spaces are orthogonal complements to row spaces. So how do you think I want to create a matrix here? Okay. So again, I want, to, I want to find a null space of a matrix. And I want to make it a null space of a matrix that has, that, and if I want to find an orthogonal complement, it is orthogonal to a row space. So what do you think I want to do? That's exactly right, yeah. I want to make a matrix where these are the rows. This will be my A. Then my orthogonal complement of the row space 
will be the null space of this particular matrix. So if you're finding orthogonal complements, and I know I'm out of time, if you're finding orthogonal complements, the way you do it is you create a matrix by using the vectors you're given as rows, and I know it's weird, right? Because every other matrix you've created is vector, they read them vector, uh, use the vectors as columns, right? This is the one exception where you're going to make the matrix be rows and then find the null space, and you know how to do that, right? You know how to do that, don't you? Okay, so, all right. So that's how you find orthogonal complements. So next time we will finish up this handout. I don't think there's much left except for adding to your mega theorem, and then we'll talk about what's referred to as the Bram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. Or you should ask Dr. Roth how he pronounces it. Or at least he did one day in my class when I had him for the <laughs> Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you on Monday.